This is Recovery Monday, brought to you by the good folks at Powell CDC, here live on 99.3 KTIA. I'm J. Michael McCoy, my co-host today, the lovely Lila Stafford in the house, who I just saw on Facebook. Ashley is packing her bags, yeah. and yeah. she's when, when is her due date? It's the 18th, but she called me today kind of in tears and said that she might deliver tomorrow. Really? So I'm going to take her to the doctor tomorrow, and they're going to. Her blood pressure is going up. Her oh no. feet are gigantic. She's got a lot of retaining a lot of water, yeah. and anyway, they're going to check some things out. And if they're like they are today, they'll deliver tomorrow. And they know it's a girl. Yeah. And her, she named her Kennedy. Kennedy. Where does that name come from? <laughs> I, mean, I love all, the name. No, I do too. But we're all Republicans. I go. You <laughs> could have thought of Republican, <laughs> Ashley. And she said, and she's so young, she she didn't even know who Kennedy is. She said, well, I just always thought of Jack Yeo. Yeah. And she said, and I think she was a beautiful woman. So well, was that's like, true. <laughs> uh, Ryan's producing today, and my special guest is a, a dear, dear, dear friend of mine, Mike. Uh, uh, Mike worked with me uh, 20 years ago mm-hmm. at a radio station. And uh, Mike taught me a tremendous amount about sobriety long before I knew what it was. In fact, the truth of the matter is, when you and I met, I probably had only been drinking about a year. I wasn't even drinking heavily yet. I didn't even know that. Yeah, because you came to work with me like in 94, 95? Uh, It was 95. 95, okay. Uh, Mike is a, as you probably can tell by the voice, is an excellent radio announcer. And he was my, what we call the graveyard shift. He worked midnight to six on a radio station that I then did mornings on, and I got to, uh, I got to uh, deal with Mike's wonderful attitude and personality. <laughs> and if you're not watching, that's in air quotes. <laughs> Every morning from 5.30 to 6. Because uh, the truth of the matter is when you work all nights on a radio station, it's pretty lonely. There's nobody else around. It's just you and the phones. And uh, if a listener would make Mike mad, man, did I hear about it. And, and then what you did is you hung around for like an hour. Well, that's because I was trying to get away home, and that you'll figure out, you know, when we because yeah. I I can't drive. All right, so if you had not, uh, you had a relapse, mm-hmm. and if you had not had a relapse, you'd have thirteen years so sober. Correct. But right now, you're about ready to hit number eight. Yep, it'll be eight years August fifth. Yeah, it's two weeks from tomorrow, Woo-hoo. and so while well, we're trying to mess him up here, <laughs> trying to you know, right before you get your sobriety birthday, <laughs> the pressure comes on. But uh, Mike's got a great story, and he's going to share it with us. And one of the things that makes his story interesting is Mike has cerebral palsy and has always had cerebral palsy, but yet, and I hate to say this out loud because his head is going to grow by the feet, (laughs) he's really smart. I mean, he's smarter than average. Uh, He's very good with math. He's very good with personal communications. He's very good with finances. Uh, But with someone with cerebral palsy, you had a hard time walking. Mm -hmm. Your appearance is not normal. No. And uh, you could never drive. No. Do you remember when I tried to get you to get your driver's license? Yeah, I thought that was hysterical. I was gonna, I was gonna pull some strings or something, Lila. You know me, J. Yeah. Michael McCoy. I can do anything. I was gonna try to get him a driver's license. Well, it wouldn't have helped because he couldn't see. Uh, but Mike would, Mike would, uh, he, Mike would take his bike everywhere. You know, ten months out of the year, he'd he'd take his uh, bike everywhere. All right. So take us back to um, uh, a very very tough childhood in Fort Dodge, Iowa. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I come from uh, the original family, and I say that, you know, the, the children that my mother and father had together, um, they were married in 1955. Uh, they were both high school dropouts, and by the time my mother was 19, she had two kids. Mm. Um, and so there was a total of f- five of us. Uh, my mother did have a child that was stillborn a couple years before me, mm-hmm. um, but there was five of us in the family, and I was right in the middle. Uh, I had two older brothers um, and an older sister and my younger brother. And we grew up in a section of Fort Dodge called Bobtown. Um, It's just, it's by the river, down by the river. I grew up about three blocks from the Des Moines River on the opposite side of the flats on the northwest side of town. Mm -hmm. Uh, We lived there probably until I was about 14. Uh, My parents split What was that neighborhood like? Bobtown? Mm Mm-hmm. It was I'm the bottoms. Too. Yeah, it was yeah. basically the bottoms. What you would refer to in Des Moines as the bottoms. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, or maybe the rough east side, if you will. Yeah, mm-hmm. not just the east side, the rough east side. Right. It wasn't no place you wanted to play around if you weren't from there. Let's right. put it that way. Yeah. 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 And it's still that way. Yeah. Um, because it's on the opposite side of the river from the poorest part of Fort Dodge, 
what they call the Pleasant Valley area um, or the flats, as it's commonly called in town. Yeah, and for those of you that are listening on the national show, uh, we're talking about Fort Dodge, Iowa, which is about an hour and a half northwest of the capital city of Des Moines, which we're broadcasting live from. Go ahead. And then, um, you know, I, I, it's hard for me to describe it because I have lots of good memories from my childhood. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's also parts of it that probably aren't so good. Uh, but when you grow up and all you know is that, you tend to think it's normal. Yeah, And, and back then, people didn't bring their business out in the street. Mm-hmm. Uh, you just didn't. You know, what happened in the house stayed in the house, and that was it. Yeah. Uh, and they were, and I grew, because of my cerebral palsy, I was not allowed to make excuses. And my two older brothers, God rest their souls, because they're, they're both passed and have been for some time. And did they pass from addictions? No, I, I think it's addictive behavior that led to it. Okay. Uh, but my oldest brother, Phil, as I've told you before, he was a Marine. And um, I think he was an angry Marine. He had some other issues on, of his own. Uh, and my brother, Raymond, who was uh, a couple years younger than him, he was 101st Airborne Special Forces. Wow. And he was one of those people that did things that aren't in history books, if you catch my drift. Sure, he was Special Forces. Right. Yeah. Be- and this is before they had Navy SEALs and all that stuff. Right. Um, and so we grew up, you know, I grew up with that and, uh, you know, always battling the cerebral palsy and I wish anti-bullying campaigns would have been around, but when I was a kid, but in an essence, it made me stronger. So tell me how kids bullied Mm -hmm. you when you were growing up with cerebral palsy. Oh, you know, you get the usual, what you might expect crippled. Um, my wife's going to be upset with me for using this word retard, um, things like that. But but scholastically, you were actually ahead of your grade. Yeah. What did that do to your self-esteem? Oh. Um, it's a good question. Um, I think it, it, it did a number of things to me for my self-esteem. It, it kind of lowered it a little bit. Mm-hmm. But it also made me fight much harder to prove that I wasn't what they said I was. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll use what Carl always says in the program. Uh, I have the uh, self-confidence of a size of Manhattan, and I have the insecurity um, the size of a pea. So, uh, and I would say Mike is the same. Incredibly insecure, but very, very confident. Mm-hmm. Very confident. Okay. I mean, you, there wasn't a project that we couldn't put in front of Mike that he wouldn't finish. It might take him literally two or three hours. How long does it take to do a 60-second commercial? Seven, eight minutes? You might work on one for an hour. Yeah. But it would be, Lila, it'd be perfect. Yeah. I won't put anything, especially when it comes to that, I won't put anything out there with my name on it that's not right. Yeah. Well, and, that's But good. it's beyond right. It's, it's, it's perfect, perfect. Yeah. Perfection. In your mind. Okay. I'm mind, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, and it's just, I think that affected it a lot. Yeah. Because believe it or not, it, as small as I am, you know, I'm five, what, five, seven, weigh 140 pounds. And I was smaller in that school. I played football. You know, I wrestled. Oh. Um, uh, there was a time in my life as an adult, I boogie boarded and attempted to learn how to surf. Oh. Um, I just, I didn't know any better. Like I've told Mac once before, when, when you're born with something like cerebral palsy, it's your normal. You don't know any different. Yeah. You don't know you're different. So when the kids yeah. would bully you, what, 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 what would you think? I mean, why, why you'd go home and tell your mother, hey, these kids called me these names. What mm-hmm. would she say? Turn the other cheek. Okay. Yeah, your mom was a tough old broad, wasn't she? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we lost her just here, what, six months ago? Uh, January 25th. January 25th. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, actually, almost exactly six mm-hmm. months ago. Yeah, she, was, she was a tough old bird. Yeah, she was. You Thank goodness. End, uh, well, my maternal grandmother, her mother... Uh, for an extended period of time, raised six girls during the Depression by herself. Whoa. Mm. She didn't meet my grandfather, whom I refer to as my grandfather, until he was like 40. And my grandfather took on all six girls and raised them. Mm. Because my mom's birth father passed away when she was about a year old. Mm -hmm. So my mom never knew him. As far as she knew, Grandpa Ray, as I used to call him, Grandpa Barnett, was dad. Yeah. And he... Just put everybody else first. Yeah. All right, so r- raised with cerebral palsy, but you still wrestled. You still played football. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you um, achieve 
in those areas at now here's the question did you achieve at the level they wanted you to or was your achievement because you did it and you were out there doing it my achievement was to prove that i could do it same as riding a bicycle you know i have memories of of me riding a bicycle and how i learned that would probably scare most parents to death you know my sister stuck me on a bicycle my older sister who's four years older than me stuck me on a bicycle when i was like seven years old and pushed me down a hill mm-hmm. whoa <laughs> you're either gonna learn how to ride it or you're gonna crash yeah and and that's how my life was yeah you know yeah would would it be fair to say uh and and this might this interview may get a little funny sometimes because i know you and if and i i absolutely apologize if i say something offensive you, you know that i love you i know that but You've always had a chip on your shoulder. Sure. Now, in the last few years, you've come to, you, you've come to equalize that chip. I, I don't think it's there like it was nearly 20 years ago. No. It, um, the, I think the reason for that is, is I let go of a lot of, thing, a lot of the anger and, and a lot of the resentment through my recovery that were giving me that chip. I'm certainly not naive enough to think that it's completely removed because it's not. Yeah. No, what, it's not. What kind of anger? What was it about? Oh, not being accepted. Mm-hmm. Not being able to achieve to the level I wanted. Mm-hmm. I'm my own worst critic. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. yeah I, I remember. <laughs> it's, I that's remember. That's just the way it is. I don't know if you quit over this or if you, mm-hmm. you took some time off, but I remember I was really worried about you because uh, Stu or Mike, he, we called him, his nickname is Stu. Um, he thought that he didn't get live broadcasts because of the way he looked. And that was never the truth. But I, there was no way I could convince him of that. Midnight to six guys don't get live broadcasts. It's just the way it works. But I remember you were really upset about that. I don't know. Was it Dot Fest or something we were doing? And you were just, you were livid. Wait, do you remember that? I, I can remember it because, and I remember leaving a message on your voicemail a couple, couple months ago when I was kind of doing some four-step work. Wow. Um, I, I remember what it was is I couldn't get the remotes that paid. I was only getting the remotes that were station promotions that didn't put money in my pocket. Okay. And, and I thought, oh, God, that made me so angry. Yeah. Um, and then, and no offense to you, but this is part of it. I remember one time, you know how the offices were upstairs? Yeah. And, and we're all sitting upstairs, and you were talking to one of our sales reps. I won't mention his name out of kindness. and He just happened to be the one that was in the conversation. But you were talking to one of our sales reps, and you were saying that I couldn't do a remote at a particular establishment, which happened to be a bar downtown. And it was because the owner of the bar didn't like the way my eye looked. Mm. And I was standing in the hallway behind you, and you didn't, even, you didn't even see me. That's how my brain works. As I was explaining to Lila, I have somewhat of an eidetic memory. Mm-hmm. I remember weird. that. Do you remember that? I don't remember the salesperson. I'm sure if you told me off, but yeah, don't say his name. You know what? I'm sitting here thinking. I, you mentioned something about your your looks, and you've just said, that I, I, there's nothing wrong with your looks. Well, I looked a lot different. This is 20 years okay. ago. Yeah, Mike Mike has had uh, uh, an incredible job done on his teeth. He's got a beautiful set of choppers before he, he absolutely didn't. And uh, what else have you had fixed? Well, yeah, and Mac was right. I mean, before I got my teeth done, I had about six grand. I've had about six grand worth of work done on my teeth. Yeah. Um, and But before that, it literally looked like I bit a brick. You yeah. Know, it was like, a, mm, that's what it looked oh. like. Okay. And my eyes, and I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, I could even show you. You see when I take my glasses off, my right eye, how it, it wanders yeah. and it's all red. And see, that, for whatever reason, makes it difficult for me to be out in the public eye like that because people don't see me. They don't see the handicap. They don't know what's wrong with me. They just, they, you know, they just used to think I was drunk or something. Yeah, and you sound normal. Right. Yeah. But, yeah, you, you, you walk like you're stumbling. Uh, I remember Rob Borsellino when the ALS came on him. Now, he, he was in recovery. Yeah. And uh, people thought he was drinking again because of the way the I ALS was it, affecting yeah. the way he walked and talked. Yeah. All right, Mike is my guest today, eight years sober next month. Uh, so he, he gets out of high school. But someplace between age seven, when his sister pushed him down the hill on a bicycle, and when he graduated from high school, he tasted alcohol for the first time. And he smoked a little doobie for the first time. 
what was that like and how did that impact him later on the ending of this story and it's really not an ending because it's ongoing but it's incredible where mike has come from it's recovery monday brought to you by powell cdc i'm j michael mccoy thanks for listening to ktia iowa Welcome back to Recovery Monday here on this uh, beautiful day uh, brought to you by the good folks at Powell CDC. Unity Point Health. If you Google Unity Point Health or you Google Powell CDC, uh, you'll be able to check them out. Powell CDC is an outpatient program uh, here in the midst of central Iowa, and uh, you're welcome to check it out. And what we always say is you now know somebody inside the recovery business, uh, Lila and I. So when you have that uh, tough situation with your brother, your mother, your spouse, your kid, your grandkid, your neighbor, your pastor, somebody in the church, and you want to be confidential, but you need to ask some tough questions, you've got Lila and you've got me. Uh, both of our numbers are, well, you're at Powell. Yeah. And my number's all over the place. So you can, my, my cell number is a public number. So. Uh, love to have you uh, come and talk to us anytime you need to. Uh, you can keep yourself confidential. You can call up and say, my name is Bob, and we'll just call you Bob uh, or Mary. If, if you're a girl, you should say Mary, not Bob. But uh, uh, for heaven's sakes, uh, use that. You now have somebody in the recovery business to help you out. And, and for those of you who don't think you know anybody that's in recovery or that needs to be in recovery, 20% of the population is in drug and alcohol uh, recovery or should be. Uh, another 10 to 12 percent, uh, I'm sorry, 20 to 22 percent is having mental health issues. Along with that, you have gambling, you have uh, food addictions, you have sexual identity, you have sexual integrity, you have, uh, did I say gambling already? Yeah. I mean, there's a mm-hmm. lot of issues out there. And all of those issues can be helped uh, by someone like Lila and someone like Powell uh, CDC. All right, let's go uh, back to our special guest now, uh, Mike. Uh, so you're in the uh, – what? well, when did you first taste alcohol? Yeah, I was mm, – it's hard to put an age number on it, but if I can associate it with years and music, I do a lot of music association, imagine that. Um, probably um, 14, 13, something like that. And do you remember when you first tasted alcohol? Well, I mean, to actually drink it, yeah. Okay, well, tell me about that. Um, I was probably, like I said, 14, maybe 15. Um, and my, I was living with my dad at the time. Okay. Uh, my dad and my stepmom. And uh, they were gone. And um, I had a neighbor next door. And, you know, kids will be kids. And one of them thought it'd be funny for us to drink. So, you know, got a can of beer, a can of Pabst, if I remember correctly. And the good stuff. Yeah, really? <laughs> and some uh, wild turkey. And, oh, my. You know, you know mm. made our own little whatever you call them. And I drank like three or four of those. And I got buzzed. And I went home and started dancing around. And it felt great. How did that, how did it make you feel based on your cerebral palsy? Did it make you feel like you had no disability? No, um, but it does. It didn't make. It did free me a little bit, as as I've told you before, and you told me today. You can't believe that, but I really am a shy person. Yeah, he, he says he's a shy. Do you think he's shy? No, you, you, you've known him <laughs> yeah. for an hour now. Okay, see, I told you. Uh, but it, it, Lila it, never lies. It, to me, it was the great equalizer. Yeah, you see. Yeah, um, especially when you got further along into the high school part. Absolutely. Because yes, I played football. And yes, I wrestled. And yes, I was in the student council. But that was eighth and ninth grade. Yeah. And, and you hit 10th grade, and all of a sudden, you can't play football no more because everybody's twice as big as you. Yeah. All of a sudden, you can't wrestle anymore because you're going to get murdered, yeah. basically. Um, and you can't be on student council anymore because you're not, quote, unquote, the popular kids from the north side. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you said mm-hmm. that you went junior high to senior high. You went from a B plus to A minus student to a barely getting by. Yeah. And why was that? Didn't care. You didn't care if you graduated? I just, No. Okay, so well, so I just so we make this clear. I mean, when I where I grew up, I imagine you too, Lila Ryan. Probably there was no question we graduate. Yeah. The question was how many years did we go to college? Yeah. You're telling me that in your life back in 1980, whenever this was, mm-hmm. it didn't matter if you graduated or not. Not to me. 
Because I knew ever since I was probably 10 years old what I wanted to do for a living. I already knew. Which was? Be on the radio. Radio, okay. Because I used to sit at home and, you know, make tapes. And me and my sister used to do, to, used to do fake radio shows. And I really don't mean to troop my own horn here, but I know you know this. It's one of those innate abilities that you're either born with or you're not. Right. Not everybody can be on the radio. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. You know, and I was just given that gift. And the other thing was that was so amazing, uh, and I don't know why this is amazing. It makes all the sense in the world, but you couldn't hear his disability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He just sounded like a great disc jockey with a big voice, and he knew music, and he had the rhythm, and he just knew how to do it. Yeah, cool. Like, for me, when I do production or produce a show, I don't have to think about it. It just, it's there. Yeah. So, and, and... You know, that's what I wanted to do. So college was not that important because at an early age, I figured out, well, even if I drop out, I can get my GED and go to community college and be on the radio. So what was your first radio yeah. job? Um, my first radio job was in 86. The way I actually got paid for was okay. in 86. Which was where? Up in Fort Dodge? Yeah, KKZ. And uh, uh, how did that feel? Awesome. Because you were how old at that time? 86. 21, 22. 21, so, so you had really reached, uh, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't a bucket list. It was a milestone that you planned on participating with the rest of your life. Yep. Plus, and I'm, these are my words, not yours. I don't think you've ever said this to me. Plus, all of a sudden now, it wasn't just the great equalizer. Now you were above mm-hmm. because you were on the radio. You were, you were a celebrity. All these people that used to bully me and make fun of me all of a sudden looked up to me. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I could walk into a bar at the age of 22 and not pay for a drink. And talk about, now let's go back to the alcohol now. So w- when, did, when were you f- fully enraged in your alcoholism? Probably my sophomore year of high school. Wow. Did you ever get kicked out of school for drinking? No. Did you drink with other kids? Yes. So that was, well, you, you had your own little group of yeah, I mean, with? yeah, I mean, you know, that's just what kids did. Yeah. You know, we had keggers. We went and got 12 packs and oh, yeah. put them in the car and went to the park, smoked a little pot, did whatever, threw Frisbee. You know, when you don't fit in with the cool kids, and that was my thing. See, these, those were the only kids that would accept me because they, mm-hmm. didn't, they didn't want nothing from me. They didn't need nothing from yeah, me. Yeah, they didn't judge you. Nope. And, you know, it's so funny. In so many situations, if you go back to your 25, 30-year class reunions, it's those kids that have been incredibly successful. And the hot, uh, uh, high-class, high-brow, rich kids fail. Mm-hmm. I've al- I always told my kids, you be nice to the ones that you consider to be a nerd because they're the ones that are going to be taking care of you when you're older. Yeah. Right. yeah. And, and this, may yeah. Sound, this may sound a little vain, and we were talking about this off-air. But my 30-year high school reunion is coming up in September. Mm. I'm not going. I don't have any desire to do it because I don't live in that world anymore, Yeah. yeah. Right. neither physically or mentally. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is, and, and I know this is going to sound vain, so I'm going to apologize up front. Um, as, uh, you know, I'm almost 50 years old. I still have all my hair. It's not gray, and I weigh the same now I did when I graduated from high school. Mm. That would make me want to go. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I told one of my dear friends from school, I, I sent her an IM on Facebook. I said, see what all you girls missed out on? You just, had to, you just would have had to wait a few more years for me to get my act together. That's, That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Mike is my guest today on Recovery Monday, brought to you by Powell CDC. When was the first time you remember alcohol having a consequence for you? Was it high school? Was it shortly after high school? Obviously, you've never had a DUI. No, but I've had three public intoxes. And is that riding your bicycle somewhere? Just walking. Just walking. Yeah. Um, w- were you a pain in the butt when the cops tried to stop you? Or, I mean, why would they hassle you? Um, well. And I'm a big supporter of the police. I, I, don't get me wrong. Well, but, you know, I don't. And I, I, there, there's a lot of different factors for that. Okay. Um, one is, and I know that, you know, one of your affiliates is a Fort Dodge station, so I'm going to tread lightly. Um, but. It's one of those things, you, you, you're a law enforcement in a small town, and you don't have much to do. So you're going to follow people around that you know are targets and easy uh, targets. Yeah. So d- did you have any public intoxics once you moved out of Fort Dodge? Nope. So really, when you moved out of Fort Dodge, a lot of your uh, 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 identity issues went away. Right. Because I didn't have to be Phil and Ray's little brother anymore. Okay. 
I didn't have to be, you know, my brother was ex Green Beret. There was expectations with that. Yeah. If somebody, you know, got in your face and you didn't fight back and you didn't get in a tussle, it, it was not looked upon kindly. Did you get in fights, physical fights? All the time. And, and why? Because you don't disrespect me in any way, yeah. shape, and form. And if you do that, there's consequences, and I'm going to show you what those are. Now, mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you a question, and I don't want you to be arrogant, but I want you to be honest. Could you kick most people's behinds? It's a 50-50 split. Okay. Okay. That was an honest answer. Because, to be honest with you, again, you know, I had my brother who was ex-Special Forces. He taught me a trick or two. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Plus, you're 100 and what would you say, 30 pounds? 135. I mean, good heavens. That's, mm -hmm. I have sides of beef that I cook on the weekend that weigh less than that, <laughs> yeah. or more than that. All right. Um, um, so tell me when the first time you got – so you move out of Des Moines. You're doing radio. You're doing good. How did alcohol impact your life and, and, and drugs impact your life as you moved into your late 20s, early 30s? Well, um, it was to a point where I, my life became unmanageable, and I can't tell you exactly when that happened. Because I don't know. Mm. Because it took me forever to recognize it. Okay. Um, I think it does most people. You know? Yeah. It, it, it became unmanageable. You know, I couldn't pay my bills. I couldn't take care of myself. Mm -hmm. I couldn't live life on life's terms, so to speak. I didn't know how. And, and I had no desire to do it. You know, I've always marched to the beat of a different drummer. Even in almost eight years sobriety, I still do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he does. You know? And... and that rubs a lot of people the wrong way, but that's who I am. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite, well, and it shouldn't be one of my favorite, but one of my outstanding memories of Mike was when he was on a local radio station here, and I knew he was upset with the management, and, and you didn't like the format either, as I recall. No. And so he decided one day he was going to quit, but he was going to go out in a ball of fire. <laughs> and I sat there and listened to this guy on the radio just slam, by name, his bosses. And I, and I remember calling him up on the hotline going, dude, what, what are you doing? And he said, I, I'm quitting. I said, yeah, no kidding, you're quitting. <laughs> it's just, and I'm still that way in my recovery, okay? But... I mean, I, I posted a, a poem by Chief Tecumseh on Facebook a couple weeks ago, and I meant every word of it when I ran across it. You know, uh, respect all men, grovel to none. Mm -hmm. And that's who I am through and through. My guest today is Mike. Uh, he is, uh, would have 13 years all together. How, how many years did you go out for research after you were in for five? Eight. So you were in for five, sober for five, mm -hmm. out for eight, and now you will have been back in sobriety for eight years. Yep. That's got to be a big deal, that eight and eight. It's just another day. Really? Seriously? Yeah. See, I, 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 I drank for 16 years, and I can tell you that 16-year chip, should God bless me with enough years of sobriety and enough days to count that, that's going to mean a lot to me. Yeah. It really will, because then I would have equalized that time that I wasted in my life consuming alcohol in an unmanageable way. Well... And here's why I say it's just another day. And you work a good program, Mac, and I'm proud of you for doing that. Thanks. But <laughs> it's just another day. Okay. I believe you. Because here's why I say that. Because if, if I look at it any other way, my arrogance is going to take over, my ego is going to take over, and right back out I'll be. Yeah, yeah. I understand that. You are. We're all just one character defect away from back out there. Mm-hmm. And as most people say, and as I'm sure you'd say, you don't have another recovery in you. No, I'm too old. Yeah, no, you're not too old. <laughs> I just, I don't have, if I went back out, I don't think there's any way I could get sober again because getting sober is too hard. Staying sober is fairly easy. All right, so the first time he got sober, what was that like? And again, in the end, what a great ending this story is going to have. Mike's my guest. Lila's here. I'm Mac, and you're listening. And I thank you for that on KTIA. Welcome back. It's uh, Recovery Monday on this uh, gorgeous day here in uh, United States of America. Lots of problems around the world. Who knows what's going to happen in the Holy Land? Is this the rising of the big bear in Russia? Uh, North Korea? I mean, just a maniac in charge. All over the world. Issues. And we don't know what's going to happen next. So all I ask for you is your prayers for all of these people across the world that are caught in the innocence of madmen 
and egomaniacs and power-hungry people, the people that are caught in the middle, the one that the death toll counts, the one that both sides say they're not responsible for, and yet the egomaniacs and the power-ridden monsters use those innocent people as shields and as body bags. Uh, it's just unfair. But that's the life we live. And with Christ at the center of it, um, we know how the ending comes, no matter what these crazy people do. So thank you for your prayers. Uh, Lila Stafford in the house. Ryan is producing. I'm J. Michael McCoy. And if I haven't told you lately, thanks for listening. Love this job. Couldn't do it without you. My special guest is Mike. He's, uh, he'll have his eight-year sobriety chip uh, here in a couple weeks. Would have had 13 years. But let's talk about the first time that you got sober. What happened that made you finally put the plug in the jug? Um, this is going to sound a little cosmic, maybe, and I don't mean it to. Uh, but I, my life was basically at the bottom which anybody in recovery knows we have to get to the bottom to go anywhere. And you were like 29, 30? 28. 28, okay. Um, and I had basically burnt all my bridges, and I was living in a place very similar to the Randolph up in Fort Dodge. Mm -hmm. And I had a cousin of mine, well, he's actually married to my cousin, who was working at one of the local recovery centers, and he had been sober for a couple of years. Somebody that I really looked up to um, had taught me how to work in multi-track recording studios and do all that stuff. And um, I just called him. I said, JJ, I can't live like this anymore, man. And prior that night before, um, as I told you, um, my brother's passed. Uh, you know, my older brother Phil was killed in 88, he, uh, victim of gun violence. And my brother Ray died in 91, a motorcycle accident. So anyway, you know, I'd been on a bender for a couple of days. And um, I wake up in the middle of the night and as God is my witness, I swear to God, they were sitting in the chair looking at me. Uh. Like, you got to stop, dude. <clears throat> so I called JJ and he come and got me. And I did uh, the detox. I wouldn't agree to go to inpatient because that was going to mess up my job and I had to have money. <laughs> so <laughs> I agreed to do outpatient. Um, so I did that. And my cousin, Char, who I love to death, um, said, will you please go to a meeting? Will you give it a try? Okay, so I did, and then I just didn't like the first couple because, again, I didn't fit in. I know you guys don't believe it, but I am shy. Um, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, would, I remember the first couple of meetings I was in, I just sat back in the corner, didn't introduce myself, didn't say hi, sat there yeah. and chain smoked cigarettes. I wasn't going to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, I was the same way at school dances. Um, but after about the fifth or sixth meeting, I, I found a couple of people that I actually knew that I used to run with. And then so it became easier from there. And I did it. And one of the weird things about that round of sobriety is about 30 days after I was sober, the place I was staying burnt to the ground and I lost everything I own. I mean, everything. Whoa. Really? Yep. Wow. I ended up um, getting taken out of a second floor window by a Fort Dodge police officer. Otherwise, Whoa. I probably wouldn't be here talking to you today. And that's the truth. Because the fire was coming. It was coming through my door. Oh, yeah. my gosh. Um, and I literally lost everything I owned. Um, and I remember when I hit the ground, it was so funny. I laugh about it now. Um, I looked at the police officer and said, anybody got a cigarette? Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm sitting there. I'd been inhaling black smoke for 10 minutes. Uh -huh. I'm like, anybody got a smoke? <laughs> so you stay sober for eight years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you were serious about your sobriety. I stayed sober for five. Or five years. Yep. Because when we, we, uh, when we worked together, you were sober the whole time. Yep. Uh, so what made you go back out and do more research? What made you give up sobriety and, and, and go play again? I was living uh, across the street from this bar up on 6th Avenue in Euclid. And I'd pass by it all the time. And I was probably just lonely for company, um, looking for a place to watch football. I'm a football fanatic. And I forgive you for being a Nebraska fan. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> no forgiveness song, but it thank is, you. It is what it is. I'm a diehard Hawkeye fan. Um, but... I want just company, you know what I mean? And, and so I thought, well, I haven't done any drugs forever. I haven't drank forever. What if, you know, we're smarter than the disease, right? Right. What if I don't do any of the drugs and I just drink? Yeah, I can do that. <laughs> so that's what I did. And, and as I was telling Lila, you know, before we went on air, that worked for a while, for about a year. Okay. 
And then my life just slowly, slowly went back to where it was. It's yeah. always the case. It's it's a progressive disease. Yep. And it, it will get worse. Now, you moved to San Diego for a while. Yep. Were you sober in San Diego? No. No. Okay. <laughs> All right. No. I just remember putting you on the bus to go to San Diego. And I, I, to be honest with you, Mike was one of the first people that I knew uh, that would talk about sobriety and alcoholism and everything like that. And I, like I told Mike, I, I, I was drinking and I didn't think I had any problem. Did you think I had, did you think I was an alcoholic? I didn't think you were an alcoholic. Um, I thought you had some other issues that needed to be dealt with. <laughs> I'm trying to be kind. No, you don't have to be kind. That's all right. I, you know, look, okay, you and I have both been in radio all our lives. And truth be told, and one of the reasons I no longer do it is because it does affect my recovery. It affects who I am and who I become. Yeah. It's, it's an industry full of egomaniacs with inferiority complexes. Yep. Mm. That's what I was thinking of. Yeah. 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 And, and as a person trying to work a good program and be the exact opposite of who I used to be, that's the last place I need to be. So, so before we hit the next break, when, what happened that you decided to try sobriety again, this time for the second time? Same thing as the first time. Bottom. Deja vu. Here in Des Moines? Yep. Okay. I was sitting up at the top floor of the Hotel Randolph, and it was a summer night, and I had just had it. I'm like, look, I'm either going to die or something because I can't do this anymore. Mm-hmm. I can't live like this anymore. And you, you never had girlfriends. You've never been not, married. You have no children. Not steadies, no. No. Okay. So once again, you were alone. Mm-hmm. I think isolation is one of the biggest problems yeah. for people to, to start drinking. And see, that's unfortunate me, for me because I like being alone. Did you have a job at the yeah. time? Or were, did you just get fired from a job? Or I was working, but it was a penny ante job where, you know, a telemarketing job where, oh, you're a convicted felon? Come on in. Sit down. We'll put you to work. One of those spots. What were you, you a know convicted I mean? felon for? I wasn't, but the oh, people that people. I was surrounded by. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, so you're surrounded by that element. But hey, as long as I had enough money to pay, to pay the rent at the Randolph, and support my drinking habit and have a little food, I was cool. Yeah. I was just existing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, I remember you hated doing uh, telemarketing. Oh, I still do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, uh, it, you know, and I was literally, and, I, and, and it, this is the truth, I lived on the top floor. So I crawled out onto the fire escape and was thinking about crawling up on the roof and I was going to jump. Mm. Whoa. And, and then I thought, well, that wouldn't be fair. Fair? Mm-hmm. Fair to who? My mother. Oh, because yeah. she had already lost two boys. Mm-hmm. You weren't going to make her lose another. Mm-mm. All right, we're going to take our last break. We'll have eight minutes when we come back, and we'll talk about what happened eight years ago that Mike finally threw it in, put the plug in the jug, and it stuck for eight years. But boy, did life change, and it also includes an incredible woman that he now calls wife. Uh, We'll talk about that when we come back. I'm J. Michael McCoy. This is Recovery Monday, brought to you by the good folks at Powell CDC. And I said this earlier, and I want to tell it to you again. You now know somebody in recovery, somebody who's out front, who doesn't hide behind anonymous. And I'm I'm not putting down anyone. I said that wrong. Someone who doesn't choose to be anonymous. Lila and I don't get an opportunity to be anonymous. I don't know what your story is. Mine was God just said, no, I'm sorry. Because I had every intention of being anonymous, quietly going to meetings. So I even thought one time, I'll just never say anything and nobody will recognize my voice. And it was God that said, no, you're, I'm going to use you because I need somebody out there front, kind of like that movie, yeah. you know. And so you now know somebody and I'm giving you permission. Lila's giving you permission to call us, contact us. I'll tell you, my life is so good. I want people to know. Yeah. That's, that's why you speak out. Yeah, that's exactly right. So give us a call. Uh, Lila is at Powell CDC. My number and contact information is all over Facebook and all over my website at MacMcCoy.com. Welcome back to Recovery Monday on this gorgeous week. We thank you for listening. Lila Stafford is my co-host. Ryan is producing. I'm J. Michael McCoy. And my very special guest is my longtime friend, uh, Mike who is just about to celebrate his eighth year in sobriety. In fact, uh, Mike and I are going to take a little road trip up to Fort Dodge because he likes to get his chips up in Fort Dodge where it all began. So it's a Saturday meeting, you said, right? It's Saturday noon. 
Yeah, and it'll well, probably have to wait till September because I'm having surgery. How how far is it from here to Fort Dodge? Uh, ninety hours. miles, hour and a half. Oh, I thought it was a couple. Couple hour and a half. It's halfway between here and the lake. I know. Because yeah. I think I'll pick him up and then bring him to our nine o'clock meeting on yeah. Saturday, and yeah. then we'll drive straight to Fort Dodge. Cool. So um, anyway, um, so it's eight years ago, and you're you're sitting in the Randolph Hotel. Uh, contemplating suicide, and you decided you couldn't do that because your mother had already buried two boys, and you weren't going to make her bury another. Mm -hmm. So who'd you call this time? Was it your cousin JJ again? No, I called my longtime childhood friend Michelle. Okay. And I told her what was going on, and believe it or not, her and her husband got in their car, drove down to Des Moines, and came and got me. Oh. And then where'd you go? Uh, I stayed at their house for a couple of days. Okay. Uh, because we had to do some trickery to get me into the treatment center. Okay. Because you had to be a Webster County resident. Okay. Oh. So I stayed at her house for like a week. So then I was technically a Webster County oh. resident again. Oh. And I also knew some people at the treatment center because I had been there before. So then I went into CFR up in Fort Dodge. And you went in as an inpatient? Yes. Okay. And how long did you stay? 30 days. All right. And uh, when you got out, were you a uh, consistent member of the 12-step program? Oh, yes. Okay, so you worked the steps. Yes. How many sponsors have you had in the last eight years? Two. Two, on your second. Yeah. And uh, um, what was different about this eight years than the previous time? Because I was doing it because um, for different reasons. I think now that I look back on my first round of sobriety, I got clean and got sober and did the right things, played the game to get the things I wanted. Mm -hmm. and, like the great job, like working for you and you know, being recognized for my abilities. Mm -hmm. And I knew mm -hmm. I had to get clean and sober to get those things. There was no other way it was going to happen. Okay, I, I want to ask you a strange question. And uh, if you can't answer this, I, I respect you. But what would have happened if you had been drinking and you would have been working for me? I probably would have quit long before I did. Okay. Uh, what would I have noticed about you differently? Mm -hmm. No, what would I? I probably would have just, I actually probably would have cared less about my job. Because you were a pain in the butt. I mean, That's because really... I care so much about what I do. Okay. You but... know, my, my grandmother Barnett always told me, any, any person can do something halfway. If you can do something, do it right. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. know? All right. So uh, this time you were doing it for you. Yep. Basically. Yep. I was doing it for me and I was, knew that I had to remove all ego and I just had to do it. And, and, and in part, I, I saw this time what it was doing to my mother. Uh, she's getting, she was getting older. And I just thought it was time. I really don't have another explanation than yeah. that. One of the um, uh, things that we have in a 12-step program is ego stands for edging God out. And there's another one. That's the one I remember. Okay. Edging God out. And when you think about it, that's exactly right. You make yeah. yourself your own idol, and you're kind of the biggest thing in life. I mm -hmm. used to put signs around my house that say, there is a God and you're not it. Yeah. Yeah. To yeah. remind myself. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, out of this round of sobriety, uh, for the first time in your life, well, I don't know if it's the first time, but you fell in love. Yes. And you fell in love with a woman who had uh, twice the sobriety you did. Right. And so she understands you. Mm-hmm. Are you nice to her? Yes. Not yeah. always. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not perfect. And I'm a perfectionist. Let's be real. <laughs> you know, it's, it's the same thing. You know, she's, we're different people. We have different personalities. But you married way up. Oh, yeah. There's no I question mean, about that. Railroad <laughs> ties miles high to the sky and back. <laughs> that's not even up for debate. That's 100% true. So she's got 16 years sobriety. 16, 17. 16, oh, who's, yeah, who's counting? Right. right. The last After, year when was. you get that far, you know and what I'm saying? You've been married for 10 mm -hmm. months now. Mm -hmm. How's the first 10 months of marriage? Uh, it, it hasn't been easy. Because you've never mm -hmm. lived with anybody, right? Not ever. Ever. I was 48 when we got married. Okay. Oh, I think that it's hard to get married and get used to somebody. But if you're 48 and have never been married, I think it would be very difficult. It was. And I'd, I'd never even lived with anybody. Yeah. He Ooh. never had a roommate. Ooh. I had roommates, but, they, oh. you know. Yeah. Not females. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Yeah. Um, and it's so, you know, it, it, it's been difficult, but the rewards I get are so much better. Yeah. The things I get in return. And one of the things I love about my wife is that she's you know, worked with the people and worked in the field she's in. She works in the recovery field. Oddly enough, for the same treatment center where I got sober, that's one of those cosmic things that yeah. you and I were talking about earlier. Because you didn't meet while you were in recovery. No. You met 
six years later. Right. Actually, I'd been sober two years. Oh, two years. Wow. When, when I so you guys dated for almost five years. Yep. Wow. Why did it take you so long to get married? I'm scared to death of marriage. Are you still? A little. Okay. I mean, my, my, my dad was married twice. My mom was married three times. It's not hard to figure out why I'm scared yeah. to death of marriage. Yeah. yeah. You know? All right. So what have you learned in marriage? That life is a compromise. You didn't think it was before? Well, yeah, but I wasn't yourself. willing to make that compromise. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, and I still have trouble with compromise. So do I. <laughs> <laughs> so because, and, and I don't, again, I don't mean to toot my own horn, but I know I'm smart. Mm-hmm. And I'm not, and I'm not going to voice my opinion unless I've got the facts to back oh, it up. Oh, you've got an opinion on everything. Sure, I do. You do. I know I do. I, I don't deny that. I told him today. <laughs> I said, "Don't you become a nag." <laughs> I said, "Nags are not just people who wear skirts. Oh, Men Lord. can have be nags just as much as women can." <laughs> well, it's one of those things where I'm super good at math. I'm mm-hmm. super good at dealing with the household finances. I'm super good at solving problems. You know, she's good at other things. She's good at English. She's good at understanding my cerebral palsy. It doesn't bother her because she used to work in a home with mentally retarded people. You know, she gets mad at me when I get down on myself, when I can't figure something out. Again, I'm my own worst critic. If it's not perfect, I'm upset. Yeah. And your cerebral (laughs) palsy continues to get worse. It doesn't necessarily get worse, but I am having health issues that I haven't had over the last couple of years. I've been on disability for about the last year, which breaks my heart. And if I keep talking about it, it's probably going to make me cry. Yeah, I know. I know you really struggled with that for a lot of years. I don't like it. And you've got major yeah. surgery coming up here uh, in a week. Yeah. Going to have your uh, gallbladder out. Yeah. And you have uh, liver cancer in your family. Uh, yep. Or gallbladder cancer. Or, it's pancreatic cancer. Okay. And so mm-hmm. that's obviously a concern. Mm-hmm. So if, if, if I'm running this interview after Mike's gone... What was the great thing about life? For me? Yeah. I got to do all the things I wanted to. And what there's, you- only, there's only two things in this, left in this world that I want to do that I haven't done. You know what they are? Uh-uh. Bungee jump and parachute. Okay. Oh. And what do you want to be remembered for? Being kind. Being kind. Okay. Cool. All right, folks. You just met one of my loves of my life, Mike. He's uh, eight years sober uh, here in a week, and he's going to get his chip. And he is the epitome of what a tough program can be like and how tough you have to be to get through it. Lila, thanks for being here today. Mm -hmm. Ryan, thanks for producing. I'm J. Michael McCoy, and as always, I ask just one thing of you. Think of that person you don't like. Think of that person you carry a resentment against. Think of that person that makes you angry and hurt and mad. And tonight, drop to your knees and forgive them. Just pray.